All right, so um, we are going to move along. We've dealt with 8.1 and 8.2, and uh, we'll get into 8.3. Just a reminder of kind of what we went over in 8.2. Remember, we're talking about infinite series, and an infinite series is essentially the sum of a sequence. And in general, the goal is to figure out whether this infinite summation actually adds up to a real number or if this infinite summation doesn't add up to anything or if it goes up, if it adds up to infinity or something like that. So the distinction there is when it converges and diverges. And we can use partial sums to figure out whether it converges or diverges if the individual terms of the series don't go to zero then the series has to diverge we saw that and then we dealt with geometric series and The big goal of infinite series is to figure out when a series converges and diverges. If the series is geometric, we have a really, really nice rule for that. Okay. Really nice rule for geometric. And then there are other series and other rules as well. Today, we're going to look at some other shortcut rules to figure out whether a series converges or diverges. So we're going to go with the integral and comparison tests. So again, we're looking to figure out whether it's when a series converges and when a series diverges. And if our series is geometric, we have a really nice rule. Sometimes partial sums are easy to see. Other times partial sums are going to be hard to see. So we're going to look at some more, quote, easy, unquote, ways to find out whether a series converges when, when it diverges. Okay. So if we have a positive function meaning the outputs are positive. And our function is continuous and decreasing. And that function is generating out the underlying sequence inside the series. Then it turns out that the infinite series And the integral are going to either both diverge or they're going to be both converge. Now, be careful about this. Some people always assume it's to the same number. It's not to the same number. All right. So if we integrate a function f of x, and we're looking at an infinite series generated out by essentially a sum of f of n. They're either going to both diverge or converge, but it's not going to be to the same number. Okay. So what this does is it gives us a connection between infinite sums 
and integrals. Everybody get that? So basically, we're going to take our sequence, our underlying sequence, and we're going to create a closed function for it. And if I can create a closed function for it, and then I integrate that closed function, if that integration from one to infinity turns out to converge, then the infinite series, where I sum up the sequence, also has to converge. Okay. Again, we have to have nice function, positive, continuous, decreasing. The de if it's positive, it has to decrease towards zero, right? We already knew that it had to go down to zero, but there you go. Now, let me give you some intuition about why this works, okay? So let's graph some function. So I have a function and it's continuous and decreasing. I'll just draw it this way. That might not be the best way. Might have to be great, but. Along the x-axis, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, blah, 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 right? Now, this function is my, or this uh, is the graph of my function f of x. Let me get that. And so what is the underlying sequence? Well, the underlying sequence inside the series is this point. That's, this point is going to be the point 1 comma a sub n. I get it because my f of x is generating out the sequence. This point is going to be 2, comma, a sub 2. Sorry, when I said a sub n, I mean that for 1, it's going to be a 1, right? For 2, it's going to be a 2. For 3, it's going to be a 3. For four, it's going to be a four. For five, it's going to be a five. Okay. Now I'm going to draw <clears throat> two things. I'm going to erase the first one and then I'll redraw it. Okay. So I'm going to erase the first one. When we talk about the integral of f of x from one to infinity, that is the entirety of the area under this curve. Again, you don't have to draw that. But the integral of f of x gives area under curve from one to infinity. Make sense? So everybody sees that. I don't want to write that one because we're going to write something different. I want you to assume for a second that that is finite, okay? Yeah. 
if that area is finite, then if I drew a bunch of rectangles, like this, and I forever draw those rectangles, that area is finite as well, because it is underneath the curve on all these rectangles here, and then we add another finite rectangle. So these rectangles also have finite area. But here's the trick. What's the area of this rectangle? Since it has width 1 and height of A1, the area of that rectangle is A1. The area of this rectangle, since it has width 1 and height A2, is area A2. And each of these rectangles has area A1, A2, A3, A4, A5, so on and so forth. Okay. So if the integral 1 to infinity of f of x, I said is finite, so if it converges, then the rectangle sum which is just the infinite series. We sum all these rectangles, A1 plus A2 plus A3, and so on and so forth. That's just an infinite series. That sum also has to converge. Now, you might say, why does that have to converge? Well, it has to converge because you can, you're always adding a little bit, little rectangles, so it's monotonic. The, let me rephrase that. The partial sums are going to have a monotonic sequence. They're always going to be increasing because you're always adding a little bit of rectangle each time. And it's going to be bounded, bounded by whatever that converges to. Does that make sense? So bounded monotonic sequence for our partial sums, and therefore it has to converge. I won't go through the the picture kind of says it all. I'm not going to go through the details. Now, what if On the other hand, we integrate, and this summation, or I mean, this uh, integration is infinite. So, what if the area under the curve diverges? Well, it turns out I can draw those rectangles in the reverse direction. So instead of drawing the rectangles to the left, I can draw them to the right. And I'm going to probably butcher this a little bit, but. And notice that these rectangles, the way I drew them here, are always a little bit bigger than the area under the curve. 
So if the area under the curve is infinite, then these rectangles, since they're a little bit bigger, also have to be infinite. Okay. So if the integration converges, then the series converges. If the integration diverges, the series diverges. Now, again, as far as converges, it's not, if it does converge, it's not going to be the same number because there is a difference between the size of the rectangles and the integration there. Okay. So it's not going to be the same because the size of those rectangles and the area under the curve is not going to be equal. But you can see that it, if one diverges, then the other diverges and vice versa. I didn't do, draw the other way, but we're going to use it in this way where we use the integration to determine the series. But you could also have used it in the reverse way. You could have used a series to defer, determine if the integration converges or diverges in the same way. So that's the idea. That's the idea of this. And this is basically what we're going to call the integral test. So the integral test is this connection, right? So I take and I calculate this integral, integrate f of x, and if that integral converges, then I say the infinite series converges. If the integral diverges, then the infinite series diverges. All right, so we saw the graphical reason for that, and now let's apply it. So let's use the integral test on the sum of n over n squared plus 4 summed up from 1 to infinity. By the way, you can imagine if you started your sum at any other number, it's going to be the same thing, right? Not going to change a whole lot. So here's what we do. We say... We're going to use f of x equals x over x squared plus 4. Right, see where I'm getting that? That's just this with n replaced with x. That is a function which is continuous from 1 to infinity. So this is continuous. It's decreasing and my function f sub n is generating out the nth terms in my infinite series. So we use the integral test. We're going to integrate from 1 to infinity x over 
x squared plus 4 dx. Now, this is something we've integrated, not a particular one, but stuff like this we've integrated before. All right. Um, you actually, this one, you use a u substitution if you let u be your denominator. then my du is 2x dx, right? Derivative of u with respect to x, then multiplied by dx on both sides. Um, I guess I'll do it this way. One half du is equal to x times dx. So we'd be integrating so the x dx gets replaced with one half du. And you end up integrating one over two u. You can factor out the one half and you get one half times the natural log of u. I, I've left off the bounds, but when I change it back to x's, I'll put the bounds back on. So, okay. So one half natural log of u becomes one half natural log of x squared plus four from one to infinity. When you plug in one, you get one half natural log of five. When we, quote, plug in infinity, or we take the limit as x goes to infinity, this piece in here goes to infinity, so I get natural log of infinity, which is infinity, right? So when you plug in infinity or take the limit as x goes to infinity, you get infinity. When you plug in 1, you get 1 half natural log of 5. Infinity minus in anything is infinity. Now, what's this mean? This means that the integral x over x squared plus 4 from 1, to, integrating from 1 to infinity, diverges. So, by the integral test, the infinite sum from 1 to infinity of n over n squared plus 4 also diverges. And that's how the integral test works. Now, you might say that took a minute to integrate. And yeah, it took a minute to integrate. But if you were to do this with partial sums, it'd be very, very difficult to see whether this converges or not, because the growth actually turns out to be so slow, it's very slow type growth, once you go from one partial sum to the next, to the next, to the next. So it's kind of hard to see that it does go off to infinity, but in this case, it does. Better see an integral test. We just integrate the function, make sure the function is continuous, uh, decreasing, and that the f sub n is equal, giving you the terms of the infinite series. So it's giving you the underlying sequence inside the infinite series. All 
All right. I want you to try this one on your own. One over n to the 1.5 summed up from one to infinity. This one should be a little bit easier to integrate. You do have to rewrite it, but. All right. <laughs> so, integration wise, well, let me rephrase this. So, we have an infinite series of summing up one over n to the 1.5 power. Okay. Now, we want to use f of x equals. 1 over x to the 1.5 power, because that's a function that's continuous, it's decreasing, and the function value at the ends gives me out the terms in my series, okay? By the way, one thing I forgot to say, this also only works when the function values are positive. If we have some positive numbers and some any and some negative numbers, then that argument I made by drawing the picture, well, the picture would dip under sometimes and go over sometimes, and it doesn't work. So I need all these, I need it to be positive needed to always generate out positive values, okay, for the integral test to work. Um, so let's integrate. Integrate one over x to the 1.5 from one to infinity. What I'm gonna have to do is I'm gonna have to rewrite this before I can integrate. I rewrite that as x to the negative 1.5 power. And now I can apply my rule about powers and integration. Add one to the exponent, divide by the new exponent. If I add one to the new x to the exponent, I get negative 0.5. 
and then divide by negative 0.5. I could uh, tack on any plus constant, but we don't need to because we're doing a definite integral. Uh, let me rewrite that. That is negative two over x to the point five. So one over negative point five becomes negative two. And then if I write it that with a positive exponent, x to the point 0.5. Now, if I take infinity and I let x go off to infinity, so the limit is x goes to infinity, the denominator gets really, really big. Numerator stays the same. So if I let take the limit as x goes to infinity, this thing goes to zero. If I plug in one, I get negative two over one to the point five power. That's just negative two. So I get that the integral 1 over x to the 1.5 power integrating from 1 to infinity converges to 2. Therefore, the infinite series Summing up 1 over n to the 1.5 power from 1 to infinity also converges, although probably not to 2. Okay. In fact, I know for sure it doesn't converge to two. It does converge, just not to two. Everybody okay with that? So this is the power of the integral test. Notice that I didn't have to find infinite series. I didn't have to find partial sums to calculate. I could just integrate something that we've done a lot of in this class. And when I integrate from one to infinity and my integration converges, I know my infinite series is also going to converge. And if it diverged, if my integration diverged, then my infinite series is also going to diverge. <clears throat> So that's the integral test as quickly as we can say it. Now, I want you to see what would happen if we changed our exponent from 1.5. We saw that infinite series converge when it was 1 over n to the 1.5. And now let's look at what's going to happen when my exponent is 0.75 or 0 0.75. And then we'll also, well, I probably won't do that, that last one, but I might do one other. Before I move on. I'll probably do one other before I move on real quick. So what we're going to do is we're going to take 1 over x to the 0.75. Now, this is continuous, decreasing. It's always positive, And the function values 
at n give me the underlying values in the infinite series. Okay. Sometimes I say the, the sequence inside the infinite series, I mean this one. The values inside the infinite series, I mean this one. So same kind of thing. So we have our nice function that meets all the criteria. So let's integrate that function from one to infinity. Once again, we're gonna rewrite it as an integration of x to the negative 0.75 power. So I can use the power rule. If I add one to the exponent, 0.75, uh, let me rephrase that, negative 0.75 plus 1 is equal to 0.25. And then I divide by 0.25, and we end up with 4 times x to the 0.25 power. Now this is a positive exponent. So as X gets bigger and bigger and bigger, X to the 0.25 power is also gonna get bigger and bigger and bigger. Slower, but still gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And therefore taking as X goes to infinity, that just gets really, really big and goes off to infinity. When I plug in one, I'll get a four. So I get infinity minus four, which is just infinity. So the integration of one over X to the 0.75 power from one to infinity diverges or diverged. And that means our infinite series, the infinite sum of one over N to the 0.75 power also diverges. So notice that 1 over n to the 1.5 converge, 1 over n to the 0.75 diverged, right? So somewhere between 0.75 and 1.5 was our convergence to divergence point with our power. And you can kind of see what's going on Anytime x is raised to a power, and that power is less than 1, when we do the integration, this is going to turn out to be positive, because when you add 1, you get Positive, does that make sense? So anytime that this power is between zero and one, not touching zero, not touching one, then I get a negative number between negative one and zero right here. When you add one to it, you end up with a positive exponent at this stage. And when you go to plug in 
infinity with a positive exponent, you're going to get infinity. Anytime this power is bigger than one at this stage, that means when you rewrite it, it's negative a power bigger than one. So it's uh, less than negative one. Does that make sense? You add one to it, it's going to be a negative power at this stage, and then it's going to have to get put in a denominator. And so plug in infinity makes it go to zero. Okay, follow that. So if I have x to a positive power, you plug in infinity, it goes to infinity. If I had x to a negative power, I plug in infinity because this is really a denominator, it goes to zero. So the cutoff is what I'm trying to argue is that the cutoff between powers that work and powers that don't work, powers that diverge and powers that converge is a one. Now let's see what happens at the particular instance when the power by the power, I mean one over n to a power, when the power of n is one. Okay. And I'm not going to take a whole lot of time here to do this one. If I wanted to use an integral test for an infinite sum, infinite series of 1 over n from n equals 1 to infinity, then my function would be 1 over x. It's continuous decreasing. The values give out the underlying sequences, this underlying sequence, and those terms in the underlying sequence are all positive. So I can integrate 1 over x from 1 to infinity. Hopefully we all know that that's the natural log of x. And I think we've seen this before, but as x gets bigger and bigger and bigger, natural log also gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and it never stops. So when you plug in infinity here, you get infinity. And so what's that mean? That means this original series diverged. Okay. So the integration diverged, and therefore the original series also diverges. So what I was arguing or what I was arguing just a minute ago has to do with this. Now that we know how to integrate 1 over x to a power and when those are going to diverge and when those are going to converge, now I can just say, well, I know if I have an infinite series of 1 over n to a power, I know when this diverges and when this converges. <laughs> and so kind of an, as an offshoot of the integral test is something we call the P-series test. So if we remember back to our integration of 1 over x to a power, we'll call it power p, 
from one to infinity. That converges if P is greater than one and diverges if P is less than or equal to one. And so a P series test just says, if we have an infinite series that looks like one over n to the P, that's a P series from last time, right? So a P series or a power series, then that series is gonna converge if P is greater than one, and it's gonna diverge if P is less than or equal to one. So a P-series test, basically, you can rewrite to say, if we have a P-series, then it converges if P is greater than 1, and it diverges if P is less than or equal to 1. And what that does, just having that knowledge, allows us to say, We can really shorten our work if we have P series. Just like when we had a geometric series, we can really shorten our work. When we have a P series, if I'm only concerned about whether it diverges or converges, I can simply look at the power and it really is going to shorten my work about converging and diverging. So let's take a look at this and do it fairly quickly. Let's use the P-series test for the infinite sum of 1 over n to the a. From 1 to infinity. And then let's do the same thing for 1 over n to the 3 sevenths. And then we'll do the same thing for infinite sum 1 over n to the point 2. And then an infinite sum 1 over n to the 8 fifths. All from n equals 1 to infinity. So we're going to do these four using the P-series test. Let's do 1 over n to the 8. Is that a converge or diverge? Converge, right? Converge, P is 8. Eight's bigger than 1, so we're going to go. How about this? 1 over n to the 3 sevenths. Diverge, right? That's diverge. My power is 3 sevenths. That power is less than equal to 1. This is point two, so diverge or converge? Diverge, right? Diverge. P is point two. That power is less than one. Anything less than or equal to one is going to diverge. Anything. Any P series with power less than or equal to one is going to diverge. And then lastly, this is a converge because the power 
is eight fifths, and that power is more than one. So notice how quickly the P-series test allows us to say converge or diverge. It's much, much faster than doing the integral test because we don't have to spend time actually doing the integration now that we've done it a few times. And it's much, much, much faster than trying to do an infinite ser series with partial sums. It'd be very difficult to do with partial sums, all of these. Some more difficult than others, but still all of them fairly difficult. Okay. Now, just... Uh, <clears throat> Just for the sake of our, let's say I have an infinite sum that instead of starting the sum at one, we're going to start at 18 and then go to infinity. And instead of being just a straight P series, it's going to be a P-series that's been multiplied by 2. So it's 2 over n to the 8. And we're summing from 18 to infinity. And similarly, what if we start our sum at 3? And we have 32 over into the, that's a point two. Sometimes people look at that and think two. That's point two, zero point two. I'll write it zero point two and write it on the board. And do an infinite sum. Okay. So even those, these, even though these don't start at one and they're not exactly P series, they've been multiplied by a number. Okay. We can still use this P series test. The reason we can use this P series test still on these is because of something we saw last time. And that's, if you multiply by a constant, it's not going to affect much. And then the other thing that we didn't see a lot of, but if you lop off the first few terms, the first few terms are going to be finite. So if it converges, all you've done is you've subtracted a finite number of terms. If it goes to infinity, Infinity minus some finite number is still infinity. Okay? So lopping off the first few terms and multiplying by a constant, we're doing a sum you know, difference, all of those types of properties that we saw last time, those aren't going to affect anything. So that's a list, a long way of saying Lopping off the first few terms isn't going to matter because that's a finite number of terms. Multiplying by a constant of two is not going to matter. This is still going to do the same thing as one over n to the eight. And so this is still going to converge because my power is bigger than one. Again, lopping off the first couple terms isn't going to matter. If the sum is infinite, then lopping off a couple of terms is still going to give us infinite sum. Multiplying by 32 is not going to matter. 
still going to diverge because the P is 0.2, and that power is less than or equal to 1. Okay, so this works just like this one does because of constant multiples and lopping off terms. This works just like this one does because of constant multiples and lopping off terms. Does that work? So now we're kind of expanding beyond the P-series into stuff that's similar to the P-series. No problem. That's just what I want. Okay. Now, in that vein, in that vein of thinking that, well, if it's kind of like a P series, then it's going to act like a P series. Okay. That brings us to comparison tests. We're going to have a direct comparison test and then a limit comparison test. The limit comparison test, I'm going to be honest, is the more powerful one. The direct comparison test is nice to use in a couple of different situations, but But the limit comparison is going to be really useful both later on in this section and then in a few sections following this one. Okay. So basically, we want to have two series that are going to be kind of similar to each other. All right. So we want to have a way to take a complex series and make it similar to something that we already know. So if you look at the series on the right, we're adding up from 1 to infinity 5 over n plus 2. Well, notice that the only variable over there is an n in the denominator. And that n is being raised to the first power. So we want to be able to compare it to something like a P-series, infinite sum of 1 over n. And the comparison test will let us do that. OK? So the first one is this. Let's say we have two sequences with all positive terms. These terms have to be positive for direct comparison test to work. And for a large enough value of n, the b's are always bigger than the a's. So a sub n is always smaller than b sub n after at least a certain point in time. The first few don't always have to be, I guess the first couple of terms don't always have to be positive. But, you know, after the 10th term or after the 15th term, we always have to have positive and the B is bigger than the N's. And we don't care about the reason why we say for large enough N is because we can always lop off the first few terms and not worry about those. So if the B's are always bigger than the A's, then if the infinite series sum from 1 to infinity of the b's converges, then so does the infinite series with the a's. So in other words, if you're adding up a bunch of bigger terms than adding up a bunch of smaller terms, also converges. So if you add up a bunch of bigger terms and that converges, then adding up the smaller terms also converges. And the reverse for diverges. If you add up 
all of the smaller terms and it diverges, then adding up all of the bigger terms also has to diverge. So it's very intentional which one's bigger. The Bs are bigger. So if the, inf if the bigger infinite series converges, then the smaller infinite series has to converge. If the smaller infinite series diverges, then the bigger infinite series also has to diverge. That's the direct comparison test. Now let's use the direct comparison test on this example. So we're going to take n plus 1 over n squared. And we're going to ask what infinite series can I compare this to that I can quickly figure out? And we've already looked at, well, the infinite series that we can quickly figure out right now are the geometric series from last time and the P series from this time. This is going to be more P series. Okay. So what does it compare to? When I look at this, this is like an n to the first in the denominator, I mean, in the numerator, divided by an n squared in the denominator. So I should probably think, well, this is like n over n squared, which is like one over n, simplify, right? And that's what I'm gonna compare to. So let's compare. to the infinite sum of one over n. Now let's take the terms, <clears throat> which are all positive. And it turns out these terms are always bigger. Okay, okay with that. Just do the cross multiplication. Everything's positive here. You get n squared plus n compared to n squared. That's always bigger, right? For n bigger than. Everybody see what I just did? So when in doubt of which terms are bigger, just compare. And then now you can see it. This one's always bigger than this one, at least for n bigger than this little one. So what do we know? We know that the infinite series 1 over n summed up from 1 to infinity diverges because this is a p-series with p greater than or equal to 1. Specifically, it's equal to 1. Right. Since these terms are smaller 
then those terms, I probably also put in, they're also positive, everything's positive. So since these terms are positive and these ones are smaller than those ones, if the smaller terms sum up, essentially <coughs> sum up to infinity, then the bigger terms are also going to sum up to infinity. Is that right? Now, I use direct comparison on this example. Um, we'll see later that you could have also used limit comparison on this example. And just like we said before, if I had started my n, my count at 10 instead of 1, everything would be exact same. Or if I started my counted something else. Everybody get direct comparison. So if the bigger, if the smaller terms sum up to infinity, then the bigger terms have to sum up to infinity too. Now, like I said, this one in particular, limit comparison is probably um, maybe a better approach. We'll talk about what limit comparison is in just a moment. But we can't always do a limit comparison. And let me give you an example. In fact, let me give you the next example. I won't flip back to my overhead slide. But the next example uses direct comparison to look at one over n factorial summed up from n equals one to infinity. All right. Now in this case, it's a little bit tricky what to compare it to because one over n factorial, you could compare it to a lot, all right? However, I'm just going to tell you what I would compare it to. I'm going to compare it to the infinite series sum of 1 over n squared from n equals 1 to infinity. Uh, let's do a comparison. Let's imagine that I'm trying to figure out what sign to put here. Okay. I multiply both sides, cross multiply. You'd say, which is bigger, n squared or n factorial? Well, you could list out a table. If I plug in one, I get the same thing. Both of these give me one. If I plug in two, I get four over here and two over there. When I plug in three, I have a nine and a six. And when I plug in four, I got 16. And then this becomes 24. So once I start plugging in bigger and bigger numbers, the n factorial is going to be bigger. All right, and the change is when n is equal to four. Does that make sense? So I won't go through the entire argument. You could list out a table, but the first few terms, n squared is actually bigger. But 
after n is equal to 4, this happens. That means these are smaller terms than those are if you lop off the first few. <clears throat> I get it? Now, what do we know about the infinite series 1 over n squared? Well, that converges because it's a p series with p of 2. Two is bigger than one, so it converges. And since one over n factorial is always smaller than one over n squared, and those terms are always positive. And read in their angle four. So if I sum up the larger terms and they converge, then summing up the smaller terms should also converge. So by direct comparison, one over n factorial also converges. Any questions about that? It's pretty. Yeah. So it doesn't matter that you're going from one to infinity as long as that is bigger for at least part of that range. It doesn't matter. Uh, not part from from one point on. So it matters that it's from one point on because here's what you do. Here's the trick you do. You say, what if you really were nervous about these first three terms? n equals one, two, three. Then what you would do is you would start your count at four and you'd say, well, this is always bigger. So this one converged if I started my count at four, this one has to converge if I start my count at four. So at n equals four, then wouldn't one over n squared become a n? Not the, this would be the, the bigger one. So this would be the BN in my direct comparison. Are you, is that what you're talking about? Yeah, I guess I'm confused. I thought N factorial got bigger after four. Yes. Yeah, N factorial gets bigger, but in the denominator, it means the fraction is smaller. Oh, so right. let, me, let me rephrase yeah, that. No, I get it now. I'm yeah, right. yeah. I'm overthinking it. Yep. So n factorials, the bigger one, but when you go one over n factorial compared to one over n, this is one over a bigger number, one over a smaller number. The fraction one over n factorial is smaller than the fraction one over n squared. Yeah. Thank you. My bad. Yeah. No, you're good. But yeah, so <clears throat> if you're worried about the first few terms, you can always lock those off. And then you say, well, this converges. And then you add back in the first few terms, which is just a finite number, so it still converges. Or if you had the opposite case, if it diverged, then add in a few more terms and it still diverges, no matter what. But yeah, so I see what you're saying. And the n factorial is bigger, so one over n factorial is smaller than one over x squared. So this is a good one to use direct comparison to because one over n factorial, that's not an easy thing to, to deal with. Now you might say, what does this converge to? Quite frankly, who knows, right? Who knows? Actually, let me 
think about that because that might have been one of the ones we saw, which were the special versions, yeah, that we saw later. So not only does it converge, but from last time, we just gave that one over n factorial sums up to E if you start your count at zero. So if we started our count at one, we just lop off the first, it'd be E minus one. So E minus the first term. So. So that's direct comparison. And you're always gonna be asked, what do you compare to? What are we comparing to? Uh, that was the one we just did. So let's look at the other comparison test. And this one's actually the one that's more used. It's called the limit comparison test. Now, this one's a little bit tricky. If we have two sequences that I call nice sequences, they're the sequences that we've been dealing with. They're decreasing sequences with positive terms. Okay. Decreasing sequences with positive terms. If the limit of the terms of those sequences, uh, let me rephrase that. If the limit of the ratio of the terms of those sequences is any real number other than zero, then the infinite series with B sub n's and the infinite series with A sub n's are going to do the same thing. They're either going to both diverge or they are going to both converge. So that's the limit comparison test. This looks more complicated than it is. Once you get used to this, all we're going to ask it, I'm not going to ask you to calculate the ratio or anything like that. I'm going to say, oh, this sequence inside the series looks like what other sequence? And then that other sequence is going to converge or diverge. Therefore, our sequence is going to, I'm sorry, the other series is going to converge or diverge. So our series is going to converge or diverge as a result. I'll once or twice go through finding the limit, but on the test, it'll be much snappier, put it that way. Okay. So here's where the limit comparison test is nice. Let's say we want to find whether this infinite series converges or diverges. We have one over three n squared minus four n plus five. Now, in the numerator, we have a constant number of one. In the denominator, we have this polynomial, which is a second degree polynomial. So we have this quadratic polynomial in the denominator. If we're talking about the underlying sequence, one over three n squared minus four n plus five, we 
What do you think that's close to as far as something we already know how to deal with? What's that kind of look like? Well, since it's one over a quadratic, we're just gonna compare it to one over n squared. Okay. So we're gonna compare this, since it's one over quadratic, we're gonna compare to an infinite sum of one over n squared. Now, in general, if I'm using the limit comparison tests, the next step will just be to say, well, this one converges, so this one converges. Okay, that's what we'll do in, in practical ways. But I will calculate the limit this time, right? I'll calculate the limit this time to show you kind of how, if you had to do all the work, how it would look. Now, it doesn't matter whether we start with this one on top or this one on top. We're going to take the limit as n goes to infinity of the ratio of this and this. And again, it doesn't matter which one you start with on top. I'll start with 1 over n squared on top. And 1 over... 3n squared minus 4n plus 5 on bottom. Is that okay? And then I'll rewrite this uh, 1 over n squared on top means I have, I can rewrite that as an n squared in the denominator. 1 over this, multiplied by the reciprocal, you get 3n squared minus 4n plus 5 in the numerator. We've taken limits like this enough to know it's polynomial of one of second degree on top, polynomial of second degree on bottom, so we can just pick out the coefficients, right? So the limit is three in that case. If you would have started with those two flipped, so this one on top and this one on bottom, then you would have ended up with a one third and the limit comparison theorem works whether the real number is one third or whether the real number is three. Does that make sense? But the limit is just a constant. So in some ways, this is kind of like just a constant times this. It's not exactly, but it's kind of like it. So the limit <coughs> comparisons test says since we know infinite sum of 1 over n squared converges. I'll leave, well, I'll leave the bounds on, I guess. Because this is a p series with p equals 2, right? So since that one converges, then the infinite sum of my series also converges. Is that okay? Now, again, in the future, I'm not going to do this a whole lot, all right? I'm not going to calculate the limit because that's kind of irrelevant. Whether the limit was one-third or three, 
you can kind of tell that these are doing the same thing. It's one over a quadratic, one over a quadratic, you know? And so we'll just say this, we'll compare it to that in the limit comparison test. And we'll skip that step and say, since we know this one converges, this one also has to converge. And it'll be a fairly quick, efficient way to figure out whether an infinite series converges. <clears throat> Let's look at another one. We have an infinite series one over the square root of five and minus two. summed up from one to infinity. I want you to take a look at that and try to think, what would you compare that to? One over the square root of n. Exactly, one over the square root of n. So we're gonna compare it to one over the square root of n because I can write one over the square root of n as one over n to the 0.5 power. And now I can go back to my p-series test and very quickly determine. And in this case, since we know that the infinite sum of one over n to the 0.5 power diverges. That's a p-series with p less than one. Then I also know that my summation one over square root of five n minus two also diverges. And once again, that's just a lot quicker than um, trying to find partial sums and going through that whole mess. By the way, if you did calculate the limit, what happens? Well, I guess depending on which one you put on top and which one you put on bottom, this becomes, you have to kind of factor out a square root of five. You factor out a square root of five, then you get square root of n and square root of n something or other, minus two over root five, uh, or two over five. But if you factor out the five, you end up with one over square root of five as your real number limit. I won't go through all the steps, but that's tough. Or if you started, if you had flipped those, it'd just be square root of five over one. Again, we don't typically calculate this. We just say, oh yeah, that's like one over square root of n. And then we know we can end up with a real number when we take the limit of the ratio of those two terms. Any questions about that? 
That's kind of nice, right? Kind of starts going quick and there's a lot less calculation once we've set up that integration is the same thing, uh, converge or diverge with the integration. And then now we have the P-series, so that's a very fast, quick and easy check. And then now we can take a limit comparison, which is a really fast, easy check of lots of different ratios. Let's do another limit comparison. Here we have n squared minus 5 in the numerator and 7n to the fifth plus 18 in the denominator summed up from 1 to infinity. What do you think I'd compare this one to? Or I'll say this, what P-series should I compare this to? One over n to the third. Exactly, one over n to the third. So I'm gonna infinite sum, one over n to the third. The key thing to look for there is it's an n squared divided by an n to the fifth, right? So you look at the leading terms. Leading term on top is n squared. Leading term on top is seven into the fifth. So the ratio between that is like an n to the third in the denominator. So I'm gonna compare it to one over n to the third, summed up. I keep doing this. I Since we know that the infinite sum of one over n to the third converges, because that's a p-series with p equals three, then this thing also converges. Again, who knows, who knows what it converges to? It's not going to be a nice thing, but it's going to converge to something. If you did calculate the limit between these two, depending on which one you put on top, it's either going to be 7 or 1, 7 when you get to the limit. Which, again, we don't need to find. We can just say, yep. Limit comparison, limit of the between those two is going to be a real number. So moving forward. It's making sense. <laughs> Obviously, uh, things can get harder and harder to see. Sometimes you'll have a mix of things underneath square roots and outside of square roots. This one's kind of maybe harder to see. One over n times square root of n squared minus two. The n times square root of n squared minus 2 is in the denominator. And for this one, well, anybody know what we should compare this one to? 1 over n squared. 1 over n squared, exactly. Yep. So compare it to 1 over n squared.
And that's because when you look at the denominator, I'm just going to do a side note here for anybody who's not seeing the n squared connection. As n gets bigger and bigger, this minus 2 doesn't play much of a role. So it's like n times the square root of n squared. But the square root of n squared is just n. So n times n. We get n squared there. So that's the thought progression, I guess, of what's happening in the denominator. And actually, that one converges as well, doesn't it? Since 1 over n squared summed up from 1 to infinity converges, because that's a p series with p equals 2. Um, this summation, 1 over the quantity n times square root of n squared minus 2 also converges. Now, by the way, I think I messed this problem up, technically speaking, all right? Because technically speaking, I probably should have started my count at 2. Because if I started my count at 1, I get a negative underneath the square root. So that kind of... So if you ever... I would say, yeah, little things like that can happen. If you catch something like that, probably not asking you to catch. I won't ask you to catch anything weird like that. You know what I'm saying? So, if you ever see some place where I started my count at two or starting in my count at three, that might be because I'm trying to avoid a weird denominator situation or a weird thing under a square root situation. But whether you start your count at one, two, three, um, the convergence or divergence isn't going to be affected. Okay, as long as we don't have, as long as you can plug all those numbers in. All right, here's the last one. I think that's the last one. Hope it's the last one. Make me a lie. If we compare n squared plus, well, excuse me, we want to use the limit comparison to calculate whether or not this converges. What do you think I should compare this one to? This one's even easier to... You can compare it to a couple of... You can do this problem a couple of different ways. But we're using limit comparison now. Well, what I could compare it to is just the number one summed up over and over and over again, right? And I know that if you infinitely sum the number one up over and over and over again, um, that diverges. Right? And therefore, this infinite sum would also diverge. So you can use the limit comparison test to see that if, since the infinite sum of one diverges, this also diverges. Now, reason I brought this up
is because this kind of goes back to the divergence rule, right? If the limit of the series, uh, let me rephrase that. If the limit of the underlying sequence is some number like one, then you could limit comparison to an infinite sum of one, which obviously diverges. Okay, and therefore my series would diverge. So it's kind of like a divergence rule when we have positive terms here. All right. So you could have we could have discovered the divergence rule that way too. That's what I'm trying to get at. So you could have discovered the divergence rule that way too. Limit of my underlying sequence is one. We know an infinite sum of ones goes off to infinity and therefore my sequence added up from one to infinity. So that infinite series also diverges. Okay. So another way we could have come across the divergence rule is using that. I haven't written it down yet, but infinite sum of one diverges. Divergence rule. Then my thing. Also diverges. Any questions about limit comparison so far? Limit comparison is one of my favorite things because it goes real quick uh, once you get it. Once you start seeing, um, oh yeah, that looks like one over n squared, or that looks like one over the square root of n, or that looks like just a bunch of ones summed up. Then it goes pretty quick, all right? Well, next time what we'll do is we'll look at a couple other um, checks. Notice that everything we've done so far, we've been comparing to P-series. And the next thing what we're going to do is we're going to look at, you know, ratios between polynomial type functions and exponential type functions or ratios between polynomial type functions and factorial type functions and so on and so forth, all kinds of different ratios between those. And then we'll do what's called a root test where the geometric um, series comes back into play. We'll kind of compare to a geometric series. That work? All right. Well, I will see you next time. That is the it for section eight three, and we'll go on to section eight four next time. Okay. I'll see you next time.